and we are live. Welcome, 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 and good morning. Thanks so much for, to, for coming on down and for tuning in. Uh, you are, just to make sure you're on the, the right flight, this is Powering Progressive Advocacy with AI. Uh, you, we've got an amazing panel here of thought leaders, expert developers, early adopters of AI. We're gonna be giving you some frameworks, ethics, ideas, tactics, like practical, tactical stuff um, that you can use to enhance your everyday work. You know, we wanna debunk some common myths. We probably have some stuff you didn't know that you need to know. Uh, we have some real life examples and we also are gonna save some time for Q&A. Uh, last year, you know, the Q&A was really, really interesting. So with that, uh, who is talking to you? Who is this gorgeous woman in, at the mic? Uh, my name is Cheryl Conti. I'm very proud to be the board chair of Netroots Nation. Uh, and I think this is gonna be one of our biggest years yet. So that's very exciting. Uh, I am the CEO at the Impact Seat Foundation, uh, which is working to create a world in which women, especially women of color, can succeed as business leaders. We're doing that through impact investing, uh, grant making, and advocacy. I'm also in the process of co-authoring a book with the amazing uh, best-selling author, Darian rodriguez Heinemann of Nonprofit Management 101, Nonprofit Fundraising 101. We're coming at you with AI for nonprofits. We've got 50 different experts committed to the project. We are using AI to write it, to talk about the AI. It's, it's, it's meta, but it's also like way up in there, okay? Uh, so, um, I would love to introduce Dr. Alan Rosenblatt, PhD, next to me. He is a digital and social media strategist, organizer, activist, professor, I mean, someone who has, you know, 300 years of experience doing this work. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's true. Uh, I'm old. He, he is director of digital research at Lake Research. No, 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 that's old. Oh, uh, this is this is this one, partner, partner at Unfiltered Media. Uh, Alan has pioneered social media events with members of Congress and leading ad advocacy organizations. He created the Center for American Progress's enterprise social media program back in the day, and has trained nearly twenty thousand people, over twenty thousand people globally, including you. Uh, on all of this stuff. He also teaches political and digital strategy at uh, George Washington University, American University, and Johns Hopkins. To my right here is the lovely and talented Craig Johnson. Craig is the founder and managing partner of Unfiltered Media. Uh, he leverages his extensive experience in political and issue-based digital communications alongside his thought leadership in AI and technology. He is also a big time hardcore nerd, okay, who codes things, uh, which is exciting. We're, we're lucky to have uh, that uh, here. Over his decades long career, he has led digital campaigns for members of Congress, Community Change Action, Census 2030, The Feminist Majority, Americans for Tax Fairness, and more. Next to him, we have Mika K. McDonald. She is a creative director, campaign specialist, writer, designer, illustrator, supermodel, as well as an avid marathoner and ultra runner. I'm just testing to make sure you're, you're with me. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, attention. With a background in policy, program management, communications, and campaigns, she has led multiple high budget progressive advocacy initiatives served in various senior management roles and generally kicked ass. Her work and ghostwriting have appeared in major publications you've heard of, like the New York Times, Washington Post, and Time Magazine, and she has written on Japanese American incarceration camps in the Princeton Journal of Asian American Studies, because she's smart like that. And finally, sure. last but certainly not least, Sonia Richards. Sonia Reynolds, is the director of special projects at the Movement Cooperative. With over a decade's experience in social justice and progressive data, she oversaw data and innovation at the New York Civic Engagement Table for six cycles 
There's like six tours of duty, not in Afghanistan, but on the internet. Uh, <laughs> while tackling projects for the AFL-CIO, Movement for Black Lives, PDI, Family Equality Council, and Latino Justice. She served as co-chair of the participatory budgeting New York City steering committee with the New York City Council Speaker's office. So she's basically mayor of New York, essentially. Ooh, I mean, me. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that. Someone else gotcha, is doing that. Gotcha. Uh, as well as treasurer and founder, co-founder of the People's Tech Alliance, AKA Progressive Hack Night. All right. Uh, and she has been a digital security trainer for NYC Stronger Communities, a project of Mozilla Foundation and the New York City's mayor's office, because again, secretly, she might be the mayor. Okay, so again. without further ado, uh, let's uh, hit the next slide. Um, yeah, that slide, so that we can start talking about why we are here. Uh, I've already delivered a few introductory remarks, so my co-moderator sure. is just... gonna talk a little bit about uh, why we're here. I'm not gonna say too much at this point, I'll talk, chime in later on, but uh, I, I think it's really important that, I think we're gonna bust a few myths here, and uh, I think uh, you'll get excited about the way we approach things, so. Um, the people on this panel actually have real hands-on experience building and using AI for progressive campaigns and politics. That is the specific issue in the specific context that matters the most here because a lot of the criticism you hear about AI is mostly attributable to AI that is not designed to do what we do. It's designed just to be AI whatever that means. So uh, there's a big difference of what that, of what that is, and uh, you're gonna hear some of that moving forward. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Mika to talk about Community Change Action. Awesome. Um, hi folks, Mika K. McDonald, she, her, Creative Director at Community Change and Community Change Action. So kind of to start things off on this panel, um, Community Change Action has been working with many of these wonderful folks uh, for uh, almost a year or so now, really trying to figure out how to face AI and how to adopt it and bring it into our organization, but also thinking about kind of those longer term, um, like power building impacts of AI. So uh, briefly, if in case you hadn't heard of us, uh, we've been around for a while. Community Change, our sister organization, was founded in 1968 after um, the heartbreak and chaos of the deaths of Martin Luther King and RFK, the original. Um, and uh, although our tactics have changed over time, those kind of values that we had from the beginning are still there. So that's investing in people, storytellers, and building relationships. And I think like that's probably true for a lot of folks who are at, are at similar organizations or who are in this work. Like We're in this because we care about people, because we want to center the human experience, and we want to make sure that folks who are impacted um, by regressive policies are the ones with the most power. And so you'll hear more about that later on in the slides. But um, our goals for AI are twofold. One is to adopt a custom-trained large language model, LLM, which you might have uh, heard that phrase around, think um, open AI, but this, as you'll see, is not evil, um, into our wider program strategies to make sure we're more effective and to make sure our staff are supported. Um, but then also on that broader lens of increasing AI literacy so that the wider progressive movement um, is invited into this space, is allowed to like have the power to innovate, have the power to experiment and start to build like our own skill set within AI. So we're not just relying on off-the-shelf tools um, by companies who might not exactly have our best interest at heart. Um, Sonia, you want to tell us about the Movement Cooperative? Yeah. Hi, Sonia. Again, Sonia Reynolds from the Movement Cooperative. Um, if you don't know us, we're a co-op of organizations. So instead of members like your local food co-op, we're our members are organizations. Um, and we started looking at AI around two years ago as it was filtering up. Um, we're a space for collaboration and best practice sharing amongst the movement, including our core infrastructure and, and all those other technology things. Um, one big value we have is like we are just this big space where folks can talk to each other and learn from each other. And we were hearing a lot of skepticism around AI. Two years ago, a lot of like, okay, what are all these risks? What are all these things I'm reading about? Um, we collected all of that 
all of those feelings and turn them into like actual real risk assessments and then um, spend some time talking to experts and developing, okay, what does it look like to use this safely? So I'm, I'm here to talk about that. All right. I think this is back. This is Mika. Yeah, back this is to back Mika. on me. Um, so as we're thinking about AI and as we're talking about it, you, you'll hear a lot about both like the moral and strategic imperatives of leaning in on this. And I think what Sonia mentioned, like the feelings around AI is very real and it's very human. Like we have something new, we have a new technology, um, like the immediate instinct, uh, the very human instinct, I don't know how many folks watched Inside Out 2 recently, can be like fear. Like that is, that is fine and that's not <laughs> something to shy away from. Um, I think it's being able to like, accept that and work through that and also realize um, that being static is how we fall behind. We know that right-wing conservative actors are already um, leaning in on this uh, without as much fear but, and also without as much morals, without as many morals. And so um, I think one of the main things that we hope to do at Community Change Action and that through this, all of this AI conversation is getting folks, inviting folks in and getting folks feel, feeling comfortable about um, figuring out how to harness that, this technology for our own purposes. Um, we also know that like with many, almost every technology, um, without intervention by folks like us, by folks in this room, by yourself, um, these tech advancements will only continue to build upon existing inequalities. Like the power structures that are in place right now that are profiting like those four people and those two zip codes you know, around Silicon Valley um, and who profit off of uh, some of these like larger AI technologies like OpenAI, um, that power structure will just continue feeding itself unless we do something about it. And so again, that's like acknowledging the feelings that come with it and not kind of shying away from it and also realizing um, that not only do we have the power to do something about it, but we need, we need to. This is one more. I'm thinking a lot about power here as you might have already uh, kind of picked up, but thinking again about those like systems of power that we're feeding and how we disrupt that by making, by elbowing our way into the space uh, and making sure that progressives and folks from within our movement are the ones building tools. Um, this doesn't have to be like a silver bullet. There's room for a lot of ideas and spaces at, and products at the table, um, but we need to make sure that uh, folks within our movement have some of that space too. And frankly, we're giving ourselves permission uh, to learn. Um, Another thing is thinking about kind of from that end, who has the freedom to innovate? Like when we think of tech disruptors, like who's the image of the person that we see in our head? Who's allowed to, you know, raise the amount of capital and then to fail fast, to like uh, move fast and break things, which is not what we're doing, but like what permission, who, who historically has been able um, to have access to that type of um, intellectual freedom? Um, it's often not folks from our communities. And so again, by like leaning in on this and making sure that as we're building out these tech, um, that we're bringing as many folks in so that um, the tech literacy is increasing and the folks who come up with like the next innovations are the ones who are actually being impacted by it and we're not being spoon fed um, by a profit machine. Um, my last piece is, I'm gonna quote Aram here, who's a member of the change agent. Um, that language isn't just language, Dickens isn't Baldwin. And I really like that quote because you, you see a lot of kind of, almost feels like colorblind approach from some of these corporations where they take language on the internet and they're like, we're just, we're just taking it and we're just like, you know, turning it, feeding our systems and then spitting it back out. Like there's nothing like wrong or evil about that. And what we do know is that like the mean on the internet like favors wealthy white men. We also know that the type of language and the type of messaging we use to communicate our issues matters. And again, it's that intervention that we need to be able to shift it or else it's gonna move forward without us. Okay, thank you, Mika, so much. So let's get into it, all right? It's okay to be skeptical. That's actually smart. You know, there's a lot of hype around AI. There are a lot of people talking about AI, like they know what they're talking about and they very, very much don't. And uh, for those of you taking pictures of your slides, thank you, that's awesome. Come up after and we're happy to uh, send these slides to you after. Just give us your email address. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, staff folks are fearful. You know, in you know, uh, doing interviews for the book that I'm writing on AI for nonprofits, you know, we're hearing that a lot where there, there are people at the top who are like, AI, it's gonna be great, it's gonna, and you know, the people, you know, under them, you know, are, uh, 
you know, it's not necessarily the, you know, uh, managing up situation that we've often had in digital where, you know, you're trying to convince hires up. It's actually the higher ups who are like, hey, AI could be a game changer. And the people under them are like, oh, see, I no, what? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, in part because there are people who are worried, is AI going to take my job? Yeah. Right. And, and the answer is no. OK, because AI, artificial intelligent is not that artificial and it's also not that intelligent. So, you know, human beings still need to be in the mix. It's not going to solve all the world's problems. What I say often is, uh, you know, it's kind of like social media, right? You remember when social media was a good thing and it was amazing and it was gonna change the world and make everything better and, and unite us all in love? Uh, Some of us. That was a beautiful time, <laughs> you know, and it was great. Like, you know, a, social media was amazing until it wasn't, right? And I think AI probably like, so let's enjoy this, this moment when it's amazing and it's gonna make our lives better. I will say though, social media has made us, us all love each other, right? and enhance that. So it's not that it's all bad. It's like, it's got pockets of good and it's pockets of bad. And I think that's a, an important consideration. I also think that it's really important on the, on the job stuff that uh, the idea here is that fundamentally what, what we do is organizing. And organizing is people organizing other people. And so what AI can do for you is reduce the amount of time you have to spend writing drafts of text and, and papers and content and make it more efficient so that you can get that part of the job done quicker and then focus more time and energy on organizing, which is what really matters. So I think that that's a really important thing to remember in terms of how this affects your careers and your colleagues' careers. Yeah, one of the things I'm hearing, again, from experts who are, who are implementing AI, you know, with nonprofits, progressive organizations, you know, even corporations, is that, you know, people are already using it, okay? There's someone, maybe someone's in your organization who are already, okay, using ChatGPT. Don't get it twisted. So, you know, the question is, you know, are you, are you in denial about that? Are you actually collaborating and sharing information about it? Do you have any sort of guidelines? Right? Are you having an active conversation internally about like what's okay with AI use and what's not? Uh, does anyone want to talk about opting out or any of that? Yeah, at TMC we just trained all of our staff on like how to ethically use AI and follow the guidelines that we, you know, we're like, oh, we told you about these guidelines, like here's actually how to use them and we ran a big staff training. We of course had folks who did not, AI is not in our job descriptions. It's nobody's job at TMC to do AI. Um, it's a special project I am working on, but like it was, nobody was hired with the expectation that they would use AI. So we allowed folks to opt out of the use of AI if they chose. They were not allowed to opt out of the training. And I think that really helped. I really like advocate for that. Like a lot of folks who came in very skeptical and fearful got more information and changed their minds and then figured out the ways that they could use it and where their line was. So I, I like really advocate for doing that. Be upfront, have your AI guidelines in place, be upfront and know what op opting out looks like in your organization, like know ahead of time. If you're at that, if you're, if you're a staff member, ask somebody else. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I want to give a shout out to some other resources that might be helpful for guidelines. Uh, many of you might know Amy Sample Ward, uh, CEO of N10, you know, which is the big, you know, nonprofit technical, um, you know, community and conference. They just put out like a very extensive, well-researched, like, guidelines, you know, for, um, for AI. So definitely check that out. Also, uh, my good friends Beth Cantor and Allison Fine wrote a book right before ChatGPT came out uh, uh, called The Smart Nonprofit, which has some really good, I think, kind of high-level thinking about, okay, AI, it's coming, you know, like it's coming at you like a Mack truck. Like what, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to jump on that truck? Or are you going to let it run it over, run you over? All right. So, who wants to tackle this one? I can speak yeah. a little bit to it, but you want to, we can tag team it, Mika. So, <clears throat> in our opinion, essentially, we kind of laid the framework, this idea that big tech is never going to let us build enough power on their platforms to threaten their own. They're never going to do it. Facebook did it. Google's done it. 
the texting platforms do it, websites are doing it every day, Google search is doing it every day, the algorithms are doing it every day. So it is our firm belief that who owns the large language model and who has the ability to harness these tools for our movement, so it's of the community and by the community, is inherently an imperative. And so, because it's essentially, our view is that ChatGPT, Claude, the rest of them, roughly talk like a college educated professor. And every single one of these services have a terms of service that bans what we do on a database basis. So if they have an inherent base, a bias that is essentially doesn't talk like us, doesn't look like us, doesn't act like us, some of the most important things that it takes to do any form of political persuasion, then it's not fit for us. So does it have an inherent bias? Yes, ours does too, but we can inherently bias it towards a more progressive view. Um, and so that's why I firmly believe that like ethical ownership like starts with ownership of the model because just outside of the biases, who owns it, terms of use, and whatever terms of data privacy they put on their uh, websites, I, how many times does a hack have to happen? How many times do the warnings about sharing your data with big tech have to be repeated before we stop putting all of our data onto their platforms every day? Um, I think there's a reason why Fortune 500 company executives aren't al allowed to use ChatGPT unless it's an own enterprise version or some other uh, instance of it. I think it's really telling that the Office of the Capitol, like of Congress, basically said you can't be putting uh, PII or sensitive campaign information into it. So if that's true, and we're already limited in using it because we don't want to give away our most sensitive information, how do we continue to do the things that this technology really advances us with without owning it itself? Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I'll say, uh, and we'll get your, we have a, a question here. Uh, you can go, I, I think it's privacy.openai.com. Um, you can actually, you know, make a request to OpenAI to say, I don't want you to use my data for your training purposes. Whether they actually will adhere to that, who knows? But you can you can make you can make a request. But one thing that I think is really interesting that I actually learned, I think, from you, Craig, is that you know the big mainstream AI platforms like your Claude or you know OpenAI, you know they prohibit use of their platforms for political purposes in the in deep in the uh, you know fine print of their terms of service. So you know if you're starting to use that, you you know you could be in jeopardy just as we have found with you know stuff like Google Ads or whatever where you know they start to pull things right or block your usage so you know i think that you know ownership right and creating your own custom uh, models which is a thing that's not that hard to do uh, is really important uh, so we had a, a quick question although you will need uh, oh mika did you have more to add you just answered it oh good okay there you go my man so we answered the question I was just going to say, um, like, on the piece on censorship and, like, how we're able to talk about, like, quote-unquote political issues, like, on some of these platforms or on some of these, using some of these tools, um, is that the term political isn't well defined, um, like we've seen on Facebook, like we've seen on TikTok. And, like, being able, you know, there's a giant IUD in the lobby right now. Does that count as being political? We are looking at, like, all these Project 2025 um, plans where they're prohibiting the use of... Uh, like the words like LGBTQ, like does that count as political? And so I think there's a slippery slope in terms of allowing a large corporation who we have already seen are very willing to work again with these conservative right-wing actors to have control over the language that we're using. Um, we already saw for OpenAI their partnership with News Corp, which is famously uh, the Rupert Murdoch kind of empire. And, um, and that came at the heels of uh, many of the staff of their integrity team uh, leaving. So we know that these corporations, again, are profit-driven, um, and the guidelines that they offer, which might look really nice in some of their press releases, like, oh, we just don't want to be political, is full of shit. Um, and if we're going to be able to organize correct, if we're going to be able to organize powerfully, we need to be able to have the freedom to actually talk about something as basic as, like, contraceptive. Yeah, did you have a quick question? Yes, I just wanted to uh bring up large language models and all of our information being consumed by 
the large corporations. What I want to know is if we're on the internet, mm -hmm. we're by the definition exposed to whatever the corporations allow or don't allow in terms of what they take out of our information. So I think the conversation ought to change in terms of how we are going to deal with what we don't know. Once we put it online, you don't know what they're going to do with it, even though we request that they don't. Indeed. So just to restate, you know, for the live stream folks, large language models, you know, they're, they're uh, the, the big mainstream, you know, you can be using them, but we really don't know, you know, what, uh, you know, information. There's actually a really interesting New York Times uh, article that you can dig up. I don't have the, the name of it. Basically, it, it went into a lot of detail in the fact that you know, a lot of these big platforms have actually broken laws in terms of like, because they're just so hungry for data, you know, that they have just, you know, snapped up, you know, copyrighted information that they really shouldn't have had. Perplexity to. got in trouble recently. Indeed, perplexity got in some real trouble, which is a dope search engine, okay? Like, yeah. I love it as a single mom, it has changed my life. So basically, perplexity, it's an app, but it's also a website. You know, instead of kind of the, you know, with Google, you know, you get all the links. Right, and then you have to kind of hunt and pack and kind of cobble together some kind of answer to your query. Perplexity does all that work for you, just like do, 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 do. it's like, and it just gives you an answer, which and is amazing. Links, yeah, which and is, links to the it's, source, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah, as links which to the is source. so helpful, dude. Again, right. as a single mom, life changing. But uh, Alan, yeah. you want to take uh, that uh, well? Let me just. Uh, yeah. One thing that Craig always likes to tell me is that one of the reasons why the mainstream AIs seem to break down over time and get stupider is because they're feedbacking data that their users are putting in. Yeah. And users are not always putting in correct data, accurate data, you know, the right value kind of data, whatever. And so it's learning from the people who are feeding it bad information. One of the reasons why Craig, the, the AI that Craig did developed, uh, it, it doesn't have that feedback loop. So not yeah, only is the yeah, not having that data feedback loop good for your privacy, it's also good for the integrity and functionality of the AI. Right. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Close let's enough. Keep, let's keep going. Keep going. All right. There's more. There's more. <laughs> okay. So let, let's talk a little bit about best practices using AI. Um, uh, I, I had talked earlier about uh, you know the efficiencies and focusing on the, the human stuff that you do so, and less time on the, on the, the drafting kind of stuff. But um, there is this conversation, you know, what do you use AI for? Do you create content with AI and then just pump it out there? No, 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 no. You have to use it for your rough drafts, all right? Uh, and so much of that rough draft that you create using AI of whatever content you're creating depends so much on what you ask the AI to do. Right? How you prompt it, what information you feed it. So prompts are a combination of uploading some talking points, uploading some research perhaps in documents, and then saying, hey, I need the answer to this question. Tell me the answer. But in the most blunt, specific ways. Like if I want to generate a bunch of uh, tweets using a hashtag, I would say something like, write me 20 tweets using this hashtag. No other hashtag, because I don't want another hashtag. Uh, trying to trend it and if you use more than one that doesn't really work very well uh, and, uh, and, and use the talking points that have been uploaded and take this angle like I'm guiding the AI to produce content that I want to have that's the creative part of it then the AI is drafting and we usually think about writing as the creative part but it's not always the creative part sometimes it's the outline or the question the posing of what you want that's the true creative part and the drafting is a mechanical like I'm going to get this into a prose form or a tweet form or a, uh, a Facebook structure form whatever it is and then when it comes out at the other end I have to look at it and say is this what I was looking for and if it isn't I'm going to make those edits and then I push it out that's a huge, uh, 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 not only is that essential, but it's the reason why AI doesn't replace the writer. The AI enhances the writer's ability to produce good content quicker. Again, allowing more time to do stuff on the, using that content to achieve your goal rather than just, uh, you know, we forever get into this conversation of do you have a publishing or an organizing strategy? Publishing is just putting it out there kind of like what the media does. But they don't tell people how to think and they don't tell people what to do with the information and that's what we want to do. Um, so this doesn't replace staff uh, and 
disclosure. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really about disclosure. I mean, you really want to highlight like where you're using AI, and, and there's sort of like a certain like argument to this too, because, uh, and we often have this discussion. You might want to have this discussion with your uh, staff. Is does an op-ed written for your executive director that's complete, like that was written by AI, deserve disclosure, or an email, or a text, or a Facebook post? If there's a human in the loop at the all stages. What's the difference between an AI helping write that communicate, like the press release, or the communications director whose name is not on it, for example, or any form like our wonderful ghostwriter here, who's been a ghostwriter for many things. Like, we don't put your name, unfortunately, because it's the definition of ghostwriting, on the articles. But you know, for text, there seems to be a culturally accepted difference than images, because I certainly want to know if images and video are uh, AI generated uh, and certainly not real. And that's something that we're gonna have to think about too because you know, uh, we are finding a lot of mis and disinformation out there. A lot of AI generated mis and disinformation. And so you know, I think it's really important that we signal what is true instead of trying to rely on you know, fact checkers on what is false. I think we've gotten to the point of like the breakdown of truth to a certain extent, especially on social media, that we really have to uh, not play fast and loose, and that's why I'm really encouraged by certain like election laws, where like there is strong disclosure laws around the use of AI. And so, always use. I don't know if you have a different opinion about the text and stuff. No, at TMC, yeah, definitely image generation, always a yeah. disclosure. On our action network, you can like have your own foot, footnote at the bottom. So our footnote just says like we do use AI in mm. drafting of messages. We just have it at the bottom of every message we send out. That's like we use Canva's AI features, and we also use Action Network. I think has. I'm not our comms person, so I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, and MC will correct me later. Um, <laughs> but we do, but we do use like the Canva like AI tools, and, and Action yeah. Network has a like I don't know an AI assistant in your script, you know, in your email yeah. creation, and we just disclose that at the bottom. Do you do you feel that it's like necessary? Like uh, it's a it's like a necessary thing because I think it's an ethical thing it's yeah. an ethical, ethical choice we've made we definitely are hitting kind of a, a bit of attention on our tech team around like early in the so a year ago we were like if you ever have if you ever use ChatGPT to help you write code that you're then going to put into our code base like we're like here's how you comment it out and we have like a very specific this is the how you comment it out that's like then it's findable and it's like really good for the person reviewing the PR. Sorry, I know I'm a little in the weeds here, but when the person who's reviewing your PR request before they push it, they're like, "This is the area that you need to spend extra time on and make sure we really understand because it was generated by ChatGPT." Now there's like copilots. We're using it so much more integrated yeah. that we're like, "Can we really comment out every single time somebody's using ChatGPT <laughs> to help them?" And they're not really reasonable anymore. So I think we're like trying. We're we're currently like thinking through how Cause to some, address that. The only reason I ask is because like sometimes I think that people get this idea that we haven't been using AI for like a decade now. It's just how visible the AI has gotten has increased. So like, you know, Photoshop has had any of the magnetic lasso stuff is a form of AI because it's predicting which pixels are supposed to be on which side of the magic lasso. And that's a technology I started with. So, yeah. you know, your social media profile algorithm is a, is a AI. It's a classifier AI, essentially just judging what is good and not. And so, um, We've been living with it a lot. I just think it's very interesting. And it's certainly the code part, because I have used AI in my own coding, obviously, because I like saving time and not thinking about stuff. But I find that very interesting. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll well, add a... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, let, let's, we need to move on yeah. to oh, some yeah. other slides. Yeah. Oh, so, sure. uh, you know, we'll, 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 get, we'll get back to these. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll circle back. Uh, you know, some of these points, you know, we've uh, already touched on, but, you know, this is our last slide before we get down and dirty in some use cases. <clears throat> but, you know, I think, uh, you know, one of the things uh, that we haven't talked about in terms of, you know, an ethics guide is chats, private chats. Chats with LLMs should always remain private. Do you have more to say on that? Yeah, I, I just, like, I'm a huge believer in privacy. Like, so if you're an organization, I would never, uh, like, have an acceptable, like, organizational use in which your boss could look at your chat GPT chats. Just much of in the same way I have the same view about Slack chats or any form of private communication, they should remain private. Um, so that's, that's one of my big things is we make it very hard to figure out whose chat was what. 
hundred percent. And copyright, you know, the law, copyright law hasn't really, you know, AI is new enough that copyright law hasn't really adjusted. Um, and a lot of these models, as we talked about, are, are playing fast and loose. Does anybody want to speak more on that? Not really. It's kind of self, uh, self-explanatory. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's dive in. Let's get all up in it. Okay. So uh, I've been talking, you know, in the course of writing the book with a lot of people who have some cool fundraising ideas. These are just a few, you know, things, just some quick hits. Uh, virtual focus grouping. This was fascinating. You know, we spoke to Joshua Hirsch, and he has been using, uh, you know, MyGPT to make his own, um, you know, sort of uh, cottage, uh, you know, um, models and GPTs. And one of the things he did is, you know, look, I have, you know, these uh, eight people that I really admire, you know, in the space, you know, who are different kinds of experts, and I'm gonna, you know, create a, a, a uh, you know, a little bot that in their voice and, and, you know, sort of sucks in their expert knowledge, then reviews my copy and tells me whether or not it's good. And I was like, you are a freaking genius. That is so crazy. What? Uh, right? Wouldn't it be great to have, like, you know, the five of us, right, just look at all of your copy? A robot can do that now for you. Uh, so you can create, you know, these personas. Uh, analysis, you know, you can import your your whole list and just ask, you know, the bot, right? Who are my super activists, right? You know, how do I, you know, optimize these messages? You know, what am I missing? You know, that you can actually, you know, get an expert opinion, you know, so much faster than it would take for you to analyze all of your emails, you know, all of your social media posts, right? Your whole list. Uh, daisy chain. Um, in terms of analysis and you know things that you can do, uh, Daisy Chain, they're an exhibitor here. It's, it's new software. One of the things you can do with their software is you can create custom personalized GIFs for each and every donor with their name on it, how much they've given, where their polling place is. It's just like a little animated, it's super cute, right? How would you feel if you got like, oh, Jane, you gave, you know, $50 last year. You're so awesome. Have you thought about voting, you know, in Baltimore, Maryland? That would be dope. Like, we would love that. Um, production, you know, you can use it to speed up, you know, all of your processes, obviously, for fundraising. You know, segmenting is a really big pain in the ass, I know, for a lot of folks. Everyone has heard, oh, it's important to segment, but, you know, isn't it easier just to push the button and blast it to everybody? You know, now, you know, AI, especially getting integrated into these platforms, are, is going to make it a lot easier to send, you know, just the things that certain people are interested in just to them. And you're obviously going to get a better response, right, when you do that. So, you know, less, less time, stronger results. More to add? No. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, you can clone yourself, or, you know, in the case of some of you, you might want to clone your spokespeople, right? And so that those people then, you know, in their voice are available to talk to people 24 seven, right? You know, and it's not them, but it is using their voice, it's using their knowledge as, you know, has been sucked in in the internet. Uh, I recommend uh, Delphi.ai, you know, to, to take a look at. Uh, Opus Clip. Opus Clip, it blew my mind when I first found out about it. Basically, you can take one of those long ass videos, okay, that like people like, you could take this, you know, the video of this where we're just talking and talking. Uh, what Opus Clip does is it just analyzes it, says these are the hottest, spiciest things that were, that were said. We're gonna create 10 clips that we think are gonna be the most viral, right? And it just makes it for you. It just instantly is your video editor right, to get the greatest gems. And then you can release that on the TikToks, on the Instas, like, right, it just makes this process like a hundred times faster. And, you know, better grant proposals. What if you could go to, you know, the Ford Foundation or Chan Zuckerberg uh, initiative and just literally analyze for the thing that you're wanting to do, okay, what are the types of grants that they've given to which organizations Right? And how can I then write a grant that's much more likely to be in the language and the voice and the vibe that they tend to give to? People are doing that. People are doing that right now. 
the Opus video uh, app is particularly interesting, going back again to, is this going to replace people's jobs? How many people here in, work for an organization that's so small that you don't have a videographer? Yeah, well, well now time. you yeah. do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's not replacing somebody. That's enhancing what you can do because you didn't have that person in the first yeah. place. In the era of short-form video and everybody needing to be on that platform because all other forms are dying, AI is going to save a lot of organizations who just cannot afford to uh, you know, hire a videographer but absolutely do need short-form video capacity. Anything more to add on fundraising? Oh, we have a, a quick question. Yes. So as a, a videographer, is that an example of AI in people's job? So the question is, I'm a videographer, and is this going to take my job? Not necessarily, because here's the thing. Opus Clip is a robot, right? It's going to do the best that it can, but it's not you. Right? Like, ideally, you know, you would use Opus Clip to just speed up. You can have more clients, right? And then from those 10 video clips, you can say, you know what? These are the three that we're actually going to test. Like, these are very much the best that are topical. I mean, you right? still have to do the original uh, videotaping in right. many Someone cases. Someone has to uh, do the original video as well. Also, I would say, like, in our field in particular, we are only, we're always having a resource constraint of three things time, people, and money. And so, like, I, it should, it's always about, in my opinion, enabling a group that would not otherwise been able to afford a videographer to produce a video, or enabling groups who do have them produce 10 times more personalized videos. So it's never about elimination of a job, it's about expanding efficiencies, about how much more volume of content can you put out. I would also add, so at Community Change Action, I run our creative department, I am a creator, uh, kind of creative. Um, and I think one of the things we think about a lot are like, what are the manual things uh, that AI can save time doing so that we can spend more time doing what actually lights our fire? Maybe that is interviewing people and finding the best questions and building in-person relationships with folks. Maybe that's spending more time like perfecting uh, our illustrations or the things that like actually represent like things deeper inside us that a machine could never represent. But being able to use AI um, to kind of take off some of that like manual kind of scaffolding so that we have more time for those creative endeavors, I think is really important and something that has helped me as well. Okay, uh, let's now, it's Craig and Mika are gonna talk uh, some more very cool uh, use cases. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this quick because we have lots of slides. So basically, like, we should keep it very simple, stupid, basically, with uh, AI. It's all about how do we take the content that is already good that we have and translate it into certain things. So, like, this happened last week. We were basically like, I like these scripts, but I really wish they were a tech script. They were a phone script initially. So can you translate and make me uh, a tech script? And about a minute later, they had the content that they needed, 95% done, there was that we changed the dates on the first version and we got four versions to choose from. Uh, we changed the dates and it was good enough. How much time did that save? It, it would have taken someone 20 minutes, even if they were very good at this task to do the same thing, it was done almost instantly and we met a deadline and it meant Christy could actually see more of her children probably because that's who I did it for. Um, and just like, this translation of text in everything is a lot of what we do. So like if you're in a, in a, vi like a meeting with your colleagues, if you record a transcript of a project you're trying to do, you can feed that transcript in an AI and get a grant proposal on the other end. Talk about fundraising, right? How many grant proposals do you have? If you give the necessary information to answer the grant proposal plus that transcript, guess what? It's going to write you a really long, very detailed grant that uh, proposal that probably has more details in it than you even thought about customer support and service. I guess from my perspective, since I'm a vendor, but you know, grant requirements and what you're going to provide, it definitely helps polish almost everything. So really saving that time from going just the recording, again, the human part, how we inputted the great materials to then save time formalizing and formatting that content is great. Okay, next slide. And so here's the other thing that I really like, is that you can basically start personalizing. And so this is like how we transferred it, and this is the answer. Sorry, can we go to the next one? Because I want to show the personalization. 
Uh, and then let's take it a step further. Um, because here's where I think we're really going. So you asked me about like, if this is taking jobs, and this is really where I think most of our effort has to go to. We are a diverse coalition of, as a movement. And the best way to increase how many people respond to our messages is to personalize it further in every communication we do. And this is in particular where AI and large language models can excel in ways that we could not have dreamed of. So for one example is if you, just getting people to be willing to translate their content into Spanish is a struggle. But oftentimes, if you talk to more than one person who speaks Spanish, that Spanish is different depending on where you come from. And so being able to dialect translate is another huge step. So what we do at Change Agent is we have a separate translation model where we support up to 23 different languages and a few more dialects. And we can take essentially what this is, a, the ChangeWire article that um, comes from Community Change Action, and we turn it into um, an email in Cuban-specific Spanish. Now, always adhering to the human in the loop. There are a few comments, as you can see, from the person who is verifying the translation. But if you're talking about enabling translations and personalizations from demographics, personas, and really targeting the person you're trying to reach, LLMs are by far the next step forward. This is the best and next step in our organizing in every facet. It enables us to create relatively culturally competent messages in language, in dialect, which is the number one way we know how to be more effective. And it's the only way that we know of proven to move people to political power. You have to look like, act like, and talk like someone to convince them of almost anything in this environment. And LLMs are the key to doing it. And I would say like signaling to people um, who might respond best to like a Cuban dialect of Spanish that they are also, they belong in this movement. So if we're, when we're thinking about jobs again and we're thinking about people who want to be part, like in person or remotely or, or however, part of the movement, seeing yourself in there, seeing that you're at least being like asked after, being, seeing that you're at least being thought of like to begin with, like allows us to expand the net of who actually belongs in this space. Um, and it in, expands like how we can communicate too. People communicate in different ways. I, again, I love illustration to the ends of the earth. Um, and I, but that doesn't mean that everyone like me thinks and communicates the exact same way. And so if we're able to allow organizations to communicate better through like these types of emails, to communicate better through social media or through like tweets or through video or f through photos, um, although that's the next step here, um, it just allows them to be able to make more connections and to build those relationships. Yeah, and change agent, uh, AI does a really good job of that. Another tool to think about is 11labs.io. It's 11 like spelled out, not 1-1. One, one. But basically you can take a video, like you could take the video of this, you could then translate it into Bulgarian. Like literally it would be us talking with what sounds like our voices, but in Bulgarian. Like, I don't know how many, you know, Bulgarian communities there are in America, you know, whatever, but, you know, wh wherever you are, you know, if you're trying to reach that group, all of a sudden something that would have cost a lot of money, taken a lot of time, but is actually really important to talk to people, right, in the language that they're most comfortable with, uh, you know, is now a lot easier and right. cheaper. Instead of hiring translators, you're hiring translator editors, right, who are just taking that that draft and polishing it as opposed to doing it from scratch. I mean, a real life case of this is Mayor Adams, speaking of the mayor of yes. New York that we don't like, um, you know, translated a PSA into like 40 different languages, one of them being Mandarin, and was being stopped on the street because people thought he actually spoke their language and were like heartwarmed about it until they realized that he faked it with AI and they didn't have a disclaimer on it, important part. Mistake. Yes, huge <laughs> mistake, huge mistake. And so, um, that personalization, though, is a huge impact. It's a huge, huge impact. Right, like people were into it, but had he said, like, hey, you know, this is <laughs> just a little thing brought to you by AI in Chinese, yeah. right? People were like, oh, you know, he's, he's making an effort, right? Kind of like when you go to France, right, and you say, s'il vous plaît, je... and, and then they're like, okay, please stop. It, I, I like that you try. <laughs> like, I give you credit for trying, but, like, I speak English. I speak English. Uh, okay, 
Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the future, and I'm going to be real quick, but missing disinformation is going to get much worse. The Ukraine-Russian uh, war, the Israeli-Hamas war are full of state and semi-state actors creating misinformation on a scale that we've never seen before. And if we don't adopt AI, there's no way we'll produce a level of content that can combat this. So I first got into AI with Classifier AI, and uh, basically I can do some online polling that's really cool of Twitter. And as soon as Elon Musk took over and allowed all the right-wing bots back, we saw a 10-point shift in the number of messages that were right-leaning versus left-leaning. That's how big and that's how much more work we have to do, especially empowered with AI, to generate real stories and real comments in as many languages as we can to combat this. Agentic AI. So AI models are at the very birthplace, I'm talking like the last three months, of being able to be put into a series of steps of actions. So I want you to imagine stuff like, what if you had a bot that could train the trainer? Because the bot knew how to train people and was coded to basically do it. What if you had the frontline organizing bot who answered the basically, uh, I hate my boss question with a bunch of uh, articles about the importance of organizing and slowly moved them up that ladder of engagement until they were ready to get into your normal RO program. What if that happened by a bot? AI is gonna be able to start doing this. An example of it is perplexity. So like, and also perplexity and then our Wikipedia search that comes with citations. The citations part is a system calling function. So you're basically giving an LLM a decision tree. What happens when you go to perplexity, which is an ingenious thing, is it essentially does a Google search and then gives that Google search to an LLM to make the decision of whether or not it should search more or just cite the answers and give it if it has found it. And that is a sort of form of decision making, even though it's not really a decision, it's pattern recognition, uh, sort of. Um, that is where we're going to go. And so they're going to start doing more steps and you're going to have specialized LLMs that do specialized things. There's going to be a manager LLM of other LLMs and their work. Um, Omni models. Your model is going to be able to talk to you. It's going to be able to generate your images and it's going to be able to generate text all in the same model. For example, um, I think realistic AI video is almost there. Everybody's seen the Sora videos, and this just goes more and more to the missing disinformation. We're not going to be able to know what's real unless someone has stamped a truth sticker on it, not the opposite, not the other way around, right? Which is how it operates now. Well, do you I, want to explain Sora for anyone who might not know? Oh, yeah, it's text to video. And here's the scary thing about this is like the open source version of this has been produced, and it's actually like really good as well. And that's where you sort of get scary and not scary because then we can own it and we're not relying on Sora, but you also unleash it for everybody else to use, which is this essentially you can write a scene out and have an AI generate that video with like music and people talking, which is crazy. Um, so, and then lastly, copyright. This is gonna be a spicy area, especially with this Supreme Court, which apparently all precedent doesn't matter and really nothing matters to them. They're true nihilists. Um, copyright law, like you can think of an LLM as essentially ingesting a book and a library roughly acting as the same thing. You could make that argument. I mean, I have made that argument. I don't know if it's true and I don't know what is gonna be true or what Congress is gonna do but um, the copyright law isn't settled and I imagine there is the possibility of some spicy fines in the future, I don't know. But it's gonna radically change and shape the kind of space of what we can and cannot do drastically. Um, all of these are like basically why we built Change Agent. Um, we can kind of skip this because we talked a lot about this. Okay. So if you wanna continue the conversation with us, um, we got a QR code, and we also have a code if you want off. Um, we'll leave it up for a bit, but then also we can start questions and answers. This is the question and answers everybody has. Yeah, but you can go to thechange.ai for a free trial. There's a special code, Netroots 2024. You get 20, $25 off. It's a lot of money. You can buy lunch for that, maybe two lunches. Or if you go to this cafe down the street, like three lunches, it's really good and cheap. <laughs> uh, and, you know, again, if you would like, uh, you know, the slides for this, um, which I think a lot of people, people are nodding their heads. How do people get the slides, Craig? Uh, I'm going to send them to them somehow. What, we, you need to maybe go on our LinkedIn 
Yeah, and, where the slides uh, will be. Yeah, or you know, for those of you, for if you're you know on the live stream, go to LinkedIn and just you know leave a message you know with your email. We'll get it over to you or send a message. If you're here in the room, you know we're happy to jot down your email and send it to you after. Or this. for some reason, if you still carry business cards. Yeah, that that whole situation. I'm from the West Coast where business cards have died. Like people just don't do it anymore. So uh, yeah, so we can take a couple of lessons. I have to actually introduce the next lunch keynote, which is important to note, there will be food, so you should come. Right. Um, but so, you know, but let's take we'll carry a couple on questions. For a few minutes, well, yeah. yeah, let's take a, a couple questions. Now, because of the live stream, you know, um, we're gonna need to, uh, oh, yeah, we'll need to uh, pass the mic. That would be great, okay. Oh, okay, oh. sure, okay, thank you. We can also share one if you don't want to get up. Um, Okay, who's got a question? Why don't we, t we took a question from you early. Well, yeah, go ahead. Just a short one. Can the conversation start when we allow a foundation or a group that we trust in terms of thinking like Wikipedia and that kind of idea where because of AI and everything that we're doing, we're gonna have to trust somebody to kind of filter through our information. Is that a conversation we need to start? I think it's already happening now. I think that the, the fact that some of the best, and Mika can speak to this because she does it on a side job of her many jobs, is like the impact of social like media influencers as trusted messenger agents. And that's like the whole point of AI is sort of like, in my opinion, how we use it is creating that trusted messenger information, helping your influencers create information that is culturally competent is huge. Um, I don't know if you have any more that you wanted to say to it, but it, it's already happening, and it's already, like, people get truth from their village leader, so to speak. It's just oftentimes that village leader is either, like, a local community leader or social media influencer. Yeah, I would just um, underline, like, we're, we're seeing journalists talk about this now more, is that there's no such thing as being objective. We all come at it through different experiences, um, through the things that we have read, through the people that we surround ourselves with. And I think viewing AI technology as similarly and making sure that you know, the ones that we're relying on to build the, the tech systems that we rely on um, aren't, like in this analogy, hanging out with Rupert Murdoch lookalikes. It's, ni it's nice to hear that journalists are finally coming around to the notion that there's no such thing as objective journalism. Well, not in this, not in this time, but go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm, Jesus. <laughs> I'm Sebastian James uh, with Michigan United. Sorry, this is Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, something that I sense is just looming a little bit above this conversation, especially when we're talking about copyright and stuff like that, would be regulation. Yeah. What are federal regulation? What would be a two or three things you'd like to see in federal regulation of AI? Oh, there's a lot that could be done. There's someone um, behind you that you can pass it to, but um, yeah, you know, the White House did actually come out with a pretty extensive, some people might remember, you know, some, you know, guidelines. You know, they're not laws, but it is some leadership. And it, it did go into quite a lot of detail. So that's worth looking up as, you know, maybe a, a signal pointer of where things are likely to go in terms of federal uh, legislation. Thoughts? I think the arbitrary uh, limits on teraflop operations dumbest thing anybody's ever thought of. Personally, I don't think I've seen an actual intelligent regulation proposed so far outside of like disclosure laws because they all ignore the fact that our biggest danger is someone in their basement creating an LLM and hosting it themselves. Spoiler alert, it's what I've done. <laughs> it's probably the biggest threat to the mis and disinformation game because there's nothing stopping that person. There are, what are you gonna do? Stop the sale of like every form of computer out there? Are you gonna stop how state actors are going to do it? AI is the future of where humanity is getting its next, pro, uh, like basically efficiency gain. I, I have ill faith in the, they, they failed to regulate the harms of social media. The idea that they're gonna <laughs> regulate idea, AI seems insane to me but I might have a controversial opinion about that. Well, you know, I, I do think, I mean, I, I was literally in a White House conference room and, and like really begged 
the administration, the Obama administration, to you know put out any form of leadership or guidelines on social media. And at the time, they're just like, you know, there was a lot of like free speech is free, you know, like let let a thousand voices bloom. Um, so we we see where that got us. I do think that the fact that the White House, you know remembered maybe the people who encouraged them to do that and put out, you know, some, you know, leadership guidelines, you know, is a step in the right direction. But yeah, we'll see. I, you know, it is helpful that the platforms themselves have gone to Capitol Hill and have encouraged legislation as well. That was, you know, I think they're trying to get ahead of it. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. There's, it's a, it's it's going to move fast and probably faster than our laws. Uh, we, let's take one more well, question. Well, we, we've oh, got right, a battle right, over yeah. the microphone yeah. going on yeah, over here. Also going to Capitol Hill so that they can ban open source so that we can't have a platform alternative to theirs. That's exactly also that like big tech wants, wants to stop us yeah. again. <laughs> so also that yeah. I might be a fan of open source here. Oh yeah, <laughs> open source. Me, me I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm pretty sympathetic to the argument that like they know they have the financial resources to be able to abide by a regulation, and so it is a little bit anti-competitive to be like, oh, give us these. These are the regulations we would like that we know we could comply with, and others couldn't. And then, and I think that just like also underlines this whole push on making sure. That like every we talk about like no one staff member usually at this point is uh, in their job description is to know like AI, but it is on all of us to become more literate in this technology so that we can have these types of conversations with the folks making the rules aren't just the folks who happen to have the most money in the room. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, one last question, you sir. Yeah, um, my name is Carter Dover. Already, I uh, work for Americans for Financial Reform and Communications Director, and we're, we're trying to sort of put in place how we use AI and if we use it and, and whatever. Um, do you know of a good, I, I fiddled around with this a little bit to sort of figure out the free versions and are they useful for writing and stuff, and I found some limited applications. Um, have you curated a good list of AI influenced or driven uh, products that we might look at to assist, because you've, you've sort of had a rat-a-tat mention of a bunch of ones. I'd love to see that. Uh, I haven't put together a list yet, although, you know, I, I am secretly gathering a little list in, in my head, but, you know, if you want to find me on the LinkedIn later and, you know, I can, I'm happy to send you um, some links. I know the Cooperative Impact Labs has like a, they have like a, a collection of all the case studies and what tools were used and what they were. I'm happy to share that as well with folks. To come yeah, up and after. again, I think um, N10 is a good place um, to go. They've definitely put some resources together. Um, and I, I'm, I suspect that one of those is a list of some places to start. And I'd also just put the asterisks that, you know, ideally we'll be able to like rely on tools that are built by the movement so that like a lot of these tools looking at like where their data is located and um, who's profiting from them. So this has been my advice to staff so far has been uh, just in the same way we will use Action Network and not one of the ones that owned by a private equity firm, you know, we're going to look for, for ways to do this. Um, incidentally, our policy people find the White House guidance loathsome. Uh, oh, and good to know. Very, very, very strong feelings about that. I only had a brief conversation with our managing director on that, so perhaps there's more to discuss. Oh yeah, there's a lot more. To, I mean, I give them credit for doing anything, okay, for taking any form. That said, right, I mean, all of this, you know, all of us should remain AI skeptics, I think is, is still, you know, everything should be seen through some sort of filter of what's the agenda Right, I'm an AI you know, yeah, and this is uh, the the builder of an AI platform. Uh, okay, uh, unfortunately, we need to start wrapping up. Uh, if you want to find us later, of course, you know we're we're all on the internet. Uh, but um, I'll rattle off our websites where you can learn more: impactseat.org, communitychangeaction.org, movementcooperative.org and the change.ai. Anything more to add from the panel as we close? Please adopt AI. <laughs> AI. Big step that you're even Don't let us fall behind. All right. 
Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in. You're awesome. Uh, we'll see you on the internet. Thank you to all of you for getting up early, you know, for, for sticking around for all the good parts. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>